a very good early good morning to everybody from Mission Control Houston and welcome to our Antares launch coverage here on NASA TV. That's the Antares rocket you're looking at right there out on the pad at the Wallace Flight Facility in Virginia. And as you can see from the countdown clock ticking down, we are just 38 minutes and 33 seconds away from liftoff. I'm NASA's Dan Hewitt, and I'll be taking you through the launch today, and riding shotgun with me is Matt Gargle, a senior mechanical engineer from Orbital ATK. Matt, thanks for being here this morning. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Excited about the launch this morning and uh, seeing OE-9 take off from Wallops. Yeah, we're definitely excited, and it is a bit of an early morning, so we also want to thank everybody tuning in uh, for either staying up or waking up with us, but we are just about, as we saw, 38 minutes away from liftoff. Here inside the room, we're in Mission Control Houston at the Johnson Space Center in Texas. Matt Abbott's uh, leading the teams right now. He's the flight director, the Orbit One team on console. They just did their go, no-go poll, and all uh, teams here in Mission Control Houston are go for launch. That radioed over to uh, their counterparts over at Orbital ATK. We're going to be operating out of two control rooms. First off, the uh, flight control room at the launch pad um, over there at the Wallops Flight Facility uh, in Virginia, where they're going to be overseeing all of the final checkouts, all the final stages of getting ready uh, to launch this Antares rocket. And obviously, once it's up in the air and Cygnus is deployed and flying free, that'll be controlled from uh, Orbital ATK's control center in Dulles, Virginia. But, as we said, uh, we are ticking down towards launch. The current launch time is 3.39 and 7 seconds central, 4.39 and 7 seconds eastern time over there on the coast, and it's a five-minute window. So, Matt, why do we have a launch window today? So we're trying to target a specific orbit to put Cygnus into to put them in a lower orbit than the space station and then they'll catch up with the space station over the next couple of days through uh, through some planned burns and maneuvers in order to get to the, the correct orbit to be grappled by the space station. So our window is just open, is open long enough, basically the amount of energy that we can put into the rocket or into Cygnus to get it into the right orbit. If it goes too long, we'll put them out of the, out of the correct orbit and they might not make it to the space station. All right, well, and it's dark, obviously, but everybody's been tracking the weather really closely. They had some inclement weather, some elements to battle, just getting the rocket out to the pad. But uh, as you can see, they're able to do that successfully. Um, at the last weather briefing, just a little over an hour ago, we were actually in the red, uh, so no go at the time for launch. That was due to some lightning um, within the, the immediate, not, well, not immediate, but within the uh, launch constraint area. Uh, however, uh, the weather officer was still optimistic that weather will be cleared up by the time of the launch, uh, which again, we still have about 35 minutes away from that launch, and we should be getting a new weather briefing shortly. But things are still looking pretty good. I think they had last reported only about a 25% uh, probability of violation, uh, weather violation for the launch, but we'll find out the latest uh, in just a little bit. So Matt, uh, kind of set the stage for us real quick if you can. So I mean, there's there's Antares. Just what are we looking at right now with this rocket here? Well, we got the rocket on the pad uh, on our launch mount there, and you can see directly next to it is our our transporter, which is what uh, Antares rides onto as it heads from the HIF, our horizontal integration facility, out to the launch pad. Uh, you can see some ducting coming off that's actually feeding conditioned air to both the payload cavity where Cygnus is and then to our stage one uh, stage one core in the different bays that that has. So our, we have a two-stage launch vehicle here. The uh, the first stage on the bottom is powered by two liquid-fueled en uh, liquid fueled engines and then our second stage is a solid rocket motor. Um, it's fully encapsulated within our fairing there along with Cygnus. All right, well, just uh, a couple of milestones still remaining in the countdown timeline. So they actually started loading that liquid fuel in a little, just almost an hour ago uh, with that uh, fuel. What, 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 what fuels uh, Antares running on this morning, Matt? Uh, liquid oxygen and RP-1. Rocket fuel. Sounds good. <laughs> But uh, that propellant loading starting uh, just around 2 a.m. or so central time, 3 a.m. over there on the east coast. And uh, the only real milestones we have coming up is right around 3.19 a.m. central, 4.19. Uh, we'll go into a uh, final 10-minute hold. 
and that'll be uh, when we're just about 20 minutes away from the actual liftoff. Now, now, why are we building these holds into these countdowns? Well, if you're listening to the count, you'll hear the team working through just basically getting the vehicle all prepped and ready for launch here, and they may work, be working through various issues. And so these holds, they allow the team to continue working those issues and not affect the final launch count and the final launch window time. So basically right. a little bit extra buffer there for... To, to work through anything that may come up. Make sure we hit that bingo mark. Well, the final countdown will start at T-minus 10 minutes and then just a few minutes, uh, T-minus 3 minutes and 30 seconds, something will happen that's called initiate auto sequence handoff for the terminal count. Now, Matt, explain that for us. So our auto sequencer is all of our, uh, all the computers start taking over at that point and it's a uh, just as it sounds, it's an auto sequencer that goes through the final steps of prepping the vehicle for launch and having it takes three minutes and 30 seconds to run that sequencer. So if there's any uh, any boards or anything goes red, they have to start that back at that 3.30 mark. All right, and it will again be that five minute window, but we are targeting that launch time at 4.39 and seven seconds Eastern, 3.39 and seven seconds here in Houston. Following that successful launch though, the first stage will fire for the first several minutes, um, about four minutes or so until Miko, our main engine cutoff, and then another bunch of series of events happen. Why don't you walk us through all that, Matt? Yeah, so as you said, we get to Miko, uh, that's uh, about 215 seconds into flight, and then we have stage one separation. So we have an explosive joint that's at the aft end of our of our upper stack, very forward end of the first stage, and we separate our two our two stages there. The the upper stack with the fairing still encapsulating Cygnus and our stage two motor goes through a, a short coast period. We then separate our fairing, another very short coast of about five or six seconds, and then we separate actually at the stage two and fly out of our inner stage. Uh, once stage two ignites, um, it, it burns for it. I think it's about a two minute burn there uh, to put Cygnus close to its final orbit, but we see another coast right at the end there where uh, we basically make sure everything's steady and stable before we separate Cygnus into their into their orbit. And then it's in orbit, and it'll it's in that initial orbit. So then that's just the first part of actually being in space. And then it's got to catch up. But uh, then it'll deploy the solar arrays, which uh, following an on-time launch, we're targeting that to come. Um, right a little after 5 a.m. Central Time uh, or 6 a.m. Eastern, we should start to see those solar arrays get deployed. And then it'll be time for Cygnus to make its way to the International Space Station. And that is its ultimate destination. It's scheduled to dock or it's scheduled to arrive on May 24th, this Thursday. Uh, any of the launch attempts um, either yesterday, today, or tomorrow would have resulted in an arrival on that Thursday date. And then once it gets to station, it'll actually get grappled by the crew on board. Uh, the Expedition 55 crew is going to be standing by to receive this vehicle. A NASA astronaut, Scott Tingle, is going to be the primary at the controls of the robotics workstation. He's actually going to take the robotic arm on station and reach out and use one of its latching end effectors, basically its hands, to grapple with the spacecraft while it's floating just about uh, 30 feet away or so. Uh, he's going to be backed up um, in that uh, operation by uh, fellow NASA astronaut Ricky Arnold. <coughs> And then Drew Foistel, also on board, is going to be monitoring Cygnus during its approach, providing any extra assistance during that operation. <clears throat> Once the vehicle's grappled, though, they'll hand over control to the teams down here in Houston, who will command the robotic arm and ultimately dock it uh, to the uh, Earth-facing port of the uh, Unity module, also known as Node 1. And then depending on the timeline, uh, they may get ahead of it and open the hatch that day or wait until the following day to begin unloading the, just about 7,400 pounds of cargo that's loaded on board. And that's going to get unloaded over the next several weeks. Cygnus is uh, scheduled to stay at the station until about July 15th before it uh, gets released. And so a lot of cargo on the way up to the, uh, the crew on station. And we'll uh, go through that and, uh, break down in just a little bit. All right, well, we're still getting a great view of uh, the rocket itself, Matt, but Cygnus is, it's kind of hidden from us right now, but I think we've got some views 
uh, of it from uh, just a couple of days ago as it was getting prepared though. Yeah, this right here is the pressurized cargo module. Uh, it's the, the upper portion of Cygnus, and what they're doing here is actually loading cargo. You can see they're rotating it around. There's uh, there's several bays in there that they can rotate it to basically get to the correct orientation to put those bags of cargo into Cygnus uh, before we take it over to our horizontal integration facility. And again, there's about 7,400 pounds of cargo, so a lot to get loaded in for the crew. Um, that one, I can see NORS written on the side of it. So NORS actually stands for a nitrogen oxygen recharge system. It's super pressurized tanks of uh, either liquid ni nitrogen or liquid oxygen that they actually fly to the space station uh, to recharge the atmosphere, the breathing gases on board for the crew. Um, and those uh, commonly flying on these Cygnus vehicles, uh, along with the usual complement, uh, science, crew supplies, food, clothing, things like that, uh, spare parts, uh, and also spacewalking equipment and other items. Again, we'll do a full breakdown a little bit later. Um, it's, it's an interesting environment when they're packing these things in. I mean, why the white suits? Why, why are they... Why are they dressed like that, Matt? The, uh, so the environment that they're in right now is a clean room, and what they're wearing is these clean suits, essentially keeps all the contamination that maybe skin flaking off, hair falling off, any of those uh, basic items that could be contaminate any of the cargo that's going up there. So what you see here actually is the pressurized cargo module. They're lifting it up and they're going to start assembling Cygnus to uh, essentially the final uh, assembly state where the we bolt the pressurized cargo module to the service module underneath. The service module, you can see the solar arrays on the left and right side there, that's in their uh, undeployed state, and as well as on the service module, it carries all the propellants for Cygnus, basically the brains of, of the Cygnus spacecraft. And a very slow and methodical process it looks like to get this attached. So. Um, and so at this point, all the cargo is packed inside, correct? No, that is not correct, oh. actually. Uh, we, once the, so here I believe this is actually in the, uh, the fueling facility. So they'll fuel Cygnus, and then they'll bring it over to the hor horizontal integration facility where Antares is, mate Cygnus to the launch vehicle, and then we'll load some more cargo uh, in the launch vehicle. And that's the final state that we can load cargo currently. However, for, uh, for CRS-2, We've developed a new fairing uh, where we're, we actually are able to remove the top and we can load cargo down on the pad within 24 hours of launch. Uh, the first one of those fairings with that design was manufactured at our Iuka, Mississippi facility and successfully went through structural tests earlier this year. We're going through some pathfinding out, out at Wallops in June this year to basically walk through all the procedures and processes to do that late load on the pad. All right, some exciting upgrades. Well. Again, back with a live view now of uh, the pad there at the Wallace Flight Facility in Virginia. And Terry's still poised for launch. Again, we're counting down to a launch time at 4.39 and 7 seconds Eastern, 3.39 and 7 seconds Central. And so everything's continuing to count down. It uh, looks like they are going to be pushing to the end of the five-minute window at this point. So our launch time now targeted to come at about 3.44 a.m. Central Time, just about 30 minutes from now, 4.44. That just to allow as much time as possible for all of the weather kind of in the area to move out. As, uh, as we had talked about just a little bit earlier, about an hour ago, uh, they had detected some lightning and were having issues with uh, cumulus clouds in the area uh, within about a 10-mile radius of the launch pad. 
Um, and so just waiting for that weather to move out. So we'll continue to monitor, and hopefully get Antares off the ground this morning. So again, on board of Cygnus, packed inside of uh, the spacecraft, which is currently underneath that shroud atop the Antares rocket, just a little under 7,400 pounds of cargo ultimately bound for the International Space Station. It's broken down into a number of different categories. Uh, one of those crew supplies, which uh, comprises things like food uh, for the Expedition 55 crew, and also items like clothing, some small care packages from friends, family, uh, and others. Um, and also clothes for upcoming crew members, uh, all comprising uh, those crew supplies. Uh, one of the largest contingents of cargo inside is actually science investigations, over 2,250 pounds packed into Cygnus, so a lot of new science investigations, which we'll go through some of those highlights in detail in just a couple of minutes, ultimately bound for the uh, International Space Station. It's about 290 pounds of spacewalking equipment gear for the crew of Expedition 55, who just completed a spacewalk this past week um, and are targeting to do another one coming up in uh, mid-June. And then the lion's share of uh, stuff on board the Cygnus spacecraft, actually vehicle hardware, 2,626 pounds worth. Also bringing up uh, 220 pounds of computer resources, things like laptops, cabling, things like that, just to keep the uh, computer architecture and the network running on board the station. Also bringing up 29 pounds of hardware for the uh, Russian crew on board. There's also some external cargo on the Cygnus vehicle, a NanoRacks CubeSat deployer, and that comes into play at the end of the mission. Uh, after Cygnus has left the International Space Station, actually deploying a number of CubeSats, small satellites uh, that can do everything from Earth observation to a number of different science experiments in low Earth orbit um, and then orbiting the Earth above. So uh, that's the, the major stuff in Cygnus. Some of those, some of the highlights of uh, the cargo on board uh, among the uh, vehicle hardware, there's a new high definition external camera assembly. Uh, one of those uh, set to be installed on that spacewalk coming up in June. Also some new eye scanning hardware for the crews. Uh, they're constantly tracking any changes in vision, eye structure, things like that. In microgravity, one of the many changes the human body goes through while exposed to that environment for long durations of time. Also some new lights on board. Uh, Cygnus for the International Space Station. They've actually been changing out a lot of the lighting throughout uh, the USOS segment of the station with uh, something they call solid state lighting assemblies. Um, these can actually change the hue and the color to help with their sleep cycles. And Matt, I don't know about you, but uh, even trying to sleep during the daytime to get ready for this this morning is tough. Uh, and as you can imagine, 16 sunsets and sunrises for the crew can be pretty tough as well, so these can actually uh, help uh, manage their circadian rhythm and uh, change color, hue, things like that, um, remove uh, different wavelengths of light uh, when it's time for bed, uh, as scientists have actually found that that can help uh, maintain their circadian rhythms, and so they can get as much of a solid eight hours as possible. And also, uh, there's going to be two NORS tanks, uh, some liquid oxygen, 
uh, pressurized for introduction into the uh, station's atmosphere, also making its way up today. And so right now we're just about 23 minutes away from the targeted time. Again, we're going to the end of the five minute window right now. So launch is targeted at 3.44 a.m. Central Time, 4.44 Eastern Time uh, over there on the East Coast where uh, the Antares rocket's currently sitting. Um, for those on the East Coast, there's actually a pretty good chance that you'll be able to see this launch this morning if you go outside and uh, look to the sky pretty much at if you're in the area along the coast from the northern part of South Carolina all the way up uh, through uh, Rhode Island and even parts of Massachusetts, there's a, a chance you'll see Cygnus, uh, weather permitting of course, um, flying through the sky. And if you've never seen a rocket launch, uh, especially from up close, highly recommend uh, checking it out uh, if you're able to. I don't know about you, Matt, but I don't think it ever gets old to see a rocket lift off. I would agree with that. I actually have not been out personally for an Antares launch yet, so I'm hoping to get out for one of those, but I've been out for several, several of our other launch vehicles, and uh, yeah, just nothing, nothing describes it, especially at night or an early morning launch when it's still dark out, and then you know, you're, you're five miles away and you just see the, the blast of light and then feel the rumble and, you know, basically just uh, you're seeing it go before any of that sound actually hits you. It's just a, an amazing feeling to see that go. And as you just saw our clock continuing to count down, we're a little under 20 minutes away. Right now the t zeros we just heard the launch conductor report, um, is 3.44 and 6 seconds central time, 4.44 and 6 seconds eastern. And that'll be at the end of the launch window, but 
I mean, that's why we have these launch windows, right? So we can wait for things like weather to hopefully get out of the way and still get Cygnus safely into orbit. And while we continue with the countdown and get ready to see Antares take flight, we do have a quick message from our new NASA Administrator, uh, Jim Bridenstine, who actually showed up there in Wallops to surprise some folks and is on hand for the first cargo launch to the space station under his term here as the NASA Administrator. So why don't we hear from him real quick. I am excited to be able to welcome everyone watching from Wallops Flight Facility and around the world to this ninth contracted mission to the International Space Station. Today, Orbital ATK has Antares and Cygnus poised to make history because every one of these launches remains a marvel of American ingenuity and innovation. These commercial launches are critical to our path going forward. I want to thank all the NASA and industry teams that have brought us to this amazing moment. We can make it look easy today, but we can never forget just how difficult it is to get cargo, let alone human beings, to space. The science that is going to space on this journey includes studies that will help our understanding of how humans, plants, and microbes adapt to living in space. There's going to be a physics research facility that scientists will use to explore how atoms interact while almost motionless or in extreme cold. There's also gonna be much more. The success of these cargo missions has been crucial in NASA's ability to work toward the further horizon of Mars. And I thank and congratulate the teams for their hard work and ingenuity that is making this possible. Thank you and have a great launch. Go Antares. And thank you again, NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine, for those remarks as we do get ready to watch Antares take off from the Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia, still tracking towards a launch time right now at 4.44 and 6 seconds Eastern Time, 3.44 and 6 seconds Central Time. We're here in Mission Control Houston. We're continuing to stand by uh, and follow along. Uh, the team here in Houston will have a much uh, larger role once Cygnus arrives at the station, especially as the crew begins to unload um, the 7,400 pounds of cargo on board the vehicle. A lot of the cargo on there, again, though, science bound for uh, work done by the Expedition 55 crew. A lot of the science flying to station nowadays coming via the U.S. National Laboratory managed by the Center for the Advancement of Science and Space, also known as CASES. And they prepared a short package here showing some of the highlights that they have launching on OA-9. Let's take a look. Three, two, one. And we have ignition. Orbital ATK's ninth resupply mission to the International Space Station encapsulates a wide range of capability and research that has the potential to benefit life on Earth. Commercial companies, academic researchers, student partners, they're all striving to test the boundaries of scientific achievement and innovation. So let's learn a little more about some of the payloads aboard the Cygnus spacecraft on this mission. A payload from the University of Alaska will evaluate pathways to enhance the biological production of the biofuel isobutene. In particular, the research team will look at network modeling of engineered E. coli under microgravity conditions. If successful, this investigation could increase the efficiency of biofuel production. Multiple CubeSats will launch on this mission with support from launch service provider Nanorax. One CubeSat mission by Spire will deploy four satellites from the Nanorax deployer mounted on the Cygnus spacecraft. These CubeSats seek to enhance tracking of ocean-going ships. Multiple education payloads will launch as part of this mission, further demonstrating the demand to engage and excite the next generation of scientists and engineers through microgravity research. 
The Quest Institute, in association with hardware partner Space Tango, will send 14 separate life and physical science payloads to station. These student investigations will range from evaluating copper crystal growth in microgravity, to looking at the prevention of E. coli and even observing slime mold in the absence of gravity. Zyput Flow Technologies, a recipient of the Galactic Grant Award from the Mass Life Science Center, seeks to validate its innovative technology, a liquid-to-liquid -liquid separator to enhance flow chemistry production. With every new resupply mission, we're seeing a wide range of innovative research and technology that can truly benefit life here on Earth. The time is now to leverage this orbiting outpost, and we look forward to many more missions with cutting-edge innovation and science. And we're back with a live view of Antares on the launch pad, currently about 13 minutes and change away from the planned launch time at 3.44 and 6 seconds central, 4.44 and 6 seconds eastern time. If you're just joining us now via social media, welcome to our broadcast and get ready to watch a rocket launch. As just during that last video, we got some good news. The range now green for weather. That was pretty much the last thing potentially standing in the way of a liftoff today as they've not been tracking any issues with the rocket or the Cygnus spacecraft itself. So Matt, I think we're, I think we're about ready to launch. It sounds like it. This will be a good one, especially the uh, like I was saying earlier. On, on dark nights like this, the launches just light up the sky, and it's uh, uh, to me personally, I think when they're a night launch or an early morning launch, it makes it a little bit more exciting. So I'm really looking forward to seeing this one go today. Yeah, and uh, with with the good weather now, everything looking much better is uh, just as. As early as just about less than an hour ago, uh, we were actually in the red. There was some lightning and some rain off the coast that they were tracking, but luckily that's moved out of the way, and we're now good. We're still targeting the end of this five-minute window. Again, the launch at about 4.44 and 6 seconds Eastern time, 3.44 and 6 seconds here in Mission Control as we're getting ready to watch this liftoff. So we're going to keep our eyes on Antares and follow along with the rest of the teams as we continue to count down towards launch. J.R. Thompson, a man who inspired us to dream big and who was a driving force for our company and our nation's space program, OA is go. OA is go. Launch team is go to proceed with final countdown at T minus 10 minutes. Check 418. And so just now the orbital ATK team doing their final go, no go, everything go for launch. Nothing standing in the way now between Antares lifting off the pad. Again, we're just about 11 minutes away, a little bit less until liftoff. And again, we're continuing to... Countdown has resumed. Ops 2, LC, or go to deactivate VVP to terminate engine evacuation. 
And so with that, we are out of the final hold. The final countdown has started at T-minus 10 minutes. Now the clock's ticking down. 9 minutes, 38 seconds and counting until liftoff. Everything continuing to look good. The team's not tracking any issues with Antares or Cygnus. And the weather green for the range, so everything looking good for a launch. Again, after liftoff, it's a pretty quick climb to orbit. Matt, why don't you kind of walk us through the steps one more time? It's, uh, it's about a nine-minute ride for Cygnus to get to orbit. So the main engines will, will ignite at T0, and they'll, they'll burn for 215 seconds, and we'll get uh, main engine cutoff. We'll go into a pretty short coast there right before we uh, separate stage one from the stage two. And then we go into a little bit longer coast, uh, about 30 seconds before fairing separation. Uh, after fairing separation, we actually have a, another separation. It's, it's an internal one where stage two then flies out of the remaining, what we call the external upper stack, which are uh, which are the, basically the three cylinders that you see aft or just below the fairing in the picture on the screen there right now. Uh, once we, once stage two is clear of our of our external upper stack, stage two ignites for about a two and a half minute burn to put Cygnus uh, real close to their orbit, where we'll coast for for a little bit just to stable every stabilize everything out, and then release Cygnus into their desired orbit. Uh, after we release them, Cygnus will start going through some of their ground and comm checks, and I think it's about an hour, hour and a half after we separate that they deploy their solar arrays and start making their way towards the space station. And it's going to arrive at the space station following an on-time launch today. It'll arrive on May 24th, uh, this coming Thursday. And once it's there, it'll actually get grappled by the crew on board. They're going to be using the robotic arm to reach out and grab Cygnus. And that should happen right at about 4.20 in the morning central on Thursday. But for now, all eyes focused on Antares. We continue to count down. Right now, we are under eight minutes away from liftoff. Seven minutes and counting until launch. Six and a half minutes away from launch, getting some great close-up views of Antares. Again, the first stage fully fueled with liquid oxygen and kerosene. And then that second stage uh, tucked away inside the shroud, still a solid rocket motor. It's going to carry Cygnus to its preliminary orbit. We are six minutes away and counting. The weather for the range still green, no clouds, no rain, no lightning in the way of Cygnus and its flight into orbit. And everything looking good so far with the Antares rocket and the spacecraft tucked away inside. Ops 1, at T minus 5 minutes, you go to transfer avionics to internal power. Ops 1 copies, standing by. And we are five minutes and counting. Power command sent, standing by five seconds. And all external power off sent. 
Vehicle on internal. Elect one, report avionics internal power status. LT elect one, internal power nominal. Ops one, you go to FT, uh, open FTS umbi loop and verify green indication. LC Ops 1, FTS Umbi Loop is open and green. Elect 2, report FTLU status. LC Elect 2, FTLU and FTS receiver indications are nominal. Ops 1, you go to send all arm command. All arm command set and set. Elect 1, report SNAs and ODM status. LC Elect 1, SNAs, ODMs, all arms. NASA TD report range status. Range is green. GNC-1, verify, ready for nav mode. LC, GNC-1, SIGI, ready for nav. Ops-2, mode. And we are four minutes away and counting in just under 30 seconds. Uh, we'll get ready to start the auto sequence handoff and enter terminal count. GNC-1, SIGI, nav mode nominal. Copy off. Check all steps through step 447. Select one, I'll wait for your call on OCCS commanding and auto sequence startup. Copy. We'll have three, uh, phase three dynamic limits active at T minus three minutes. LC Elect 1, verified mission time set to T minus 180 at T minus 3 minutes 10 seconds. And we are about 3 minutes away and counting. Control is transferred to CSOE. ODM bus voltages and currents nominal. Copy all. LC Core 1, uh, VTS service. Copy Core 1. EHS charging is nominal. Roger that, EHS. And T minus two minutes. Mark. And two minutes and counting from Antares launch. Again, we're just a little under a minute and a half away from launch. It's only about a nine minute ride into orbit, so the next 10 minutes get a lot more exciting for us here as Antares is about to lift off from the Wilds Flight Facility in Virginia. Copy, Core 1. T minus one minute. Mark. Preliminary fuel tank pressurization started. Roger that, Core 1. All on best source telemetry. T minus 30 seconds. Mark. Minus 10. Mark. Five, four, three, two, one.
And Antares lifting off, going across the night sky, disappearing through some clouds quickly and coming quickly back into view. The first stage looking nominal or normal so far, lighting up the night sky there above Virginia. Orbital ATK's Antares on its way. Getting good performance calls, the attitude, the orientation of the rocket looking normal. just passing through max Q, the maximum aerodynamic pressure. That's where uh, the forces of launch, the highest on the launch vehicle. The first stage though, continuing to fire. It's gonna cut off about 215 seconds into the flight, or just a little over three minutes. Vehicle attitude is nominal. Passing 100,000 feet altitude and 7,000 feet per second. Engines remain at full thrust. Attitude still good. Avionics power is good. TVC steering looks good. Passing 150,000 feet. Engine steady as 100% thrust as we pass 10,000 feet. And getting a great animation now uh, as we get the performance call still from the Orbital ATK flight engineers. Everything looking good so far with Antares. As you can see already in altitude of over 37 miles, 38 miles and climbing. The vehicle approaching 6,000 miles an hour in velocity already. The uh, slow throttle ramp. And you can see its flight path in the lower right corner. Again, it flies in the southeasterly trajectory away from Virginia, out over the Atlantic Ocean. Operation at 55 percent. It's passing 15,000 feet per second. TVC slewing for main engine shutdown. And we're going to be standing by for MECO or main engine cutoff for the first stage. Altitude. Core pressures remain nominal with VNO4 and VNO5 open. And we have MECO. And MECO, or that main engine cutoff, is confirmed. Storm. The first stage, the fuel gone, its job done, dropping away. And Ceres is in a brief coast phase now. We wait to, for the uh, right conditions. As Matt described, now we're in a bit of a coast stage here. ACS is enabled. Yeah, a short coast phase here, and the uh, next event will be the fairing separation. Uh, we had nominal stage one burnout velocity at just over 17,300 feet per second. We have fairing separation and interstage separation. All right, well, the fairing and the interstage dropping away, Cygnus in the second stage now exposed. We have T plus 260, TVC. And we have stage two ignition. And a good confirmation the engine on the stage two. It's a solid rocket motor, now ignited. And it's going to continue to boost Cygnus into orbit. Stage two uh, ramping up to full pressure. A Castor 30 motor will burn for uh, approximately 150 seconds. Avionics power remains nominal. Stage two attitude is nominal. Stage 2 TVC performance looks good. Castro 30 XL motor is past. And everything continuing to look great with this flight so far. The vehicle already traveling in excess of 10,000 miles an hour for 100 miles in altitude. Power remains nominal. As we're just a little over five minutes into the flight already. Power 
our systems remain good. Stage 2 TVC is nominal. Power is nominal. We're approximately halfway through stage 2 burn at this point. Avionic systems remain healthy at this point. Stage 2 TVC is nominal. So just about one minute left on the second stage firing. All systems are performing well at this point. As you're hearing, everything's still looking good with Cygnus and the Antares rocket. Power remains good. Attitude remains nominal. Caster 30XL motor pressure starting to tail off. Power systems remain good. Stage two, and we have stage two burnout. Interiors will now coast for approximately two minutes uh, before payload separation. FTS is disabled. And with that second stage cut off and the coast now underway, the Antares rocket largely done its job so far. So it's going to continue to coast. They'll, we'll get these performance calls from uh, the orbital engineers. But everything's still looking really good for Cygnus. Soon going to be in its preliminary orbit and then get ready to deploy the solar arrays following that, and then begin its chase down of the International Space Station. Nominal avionics power systems all look good at this point. Power is nominal. Attitude uh, remains nominal as we await payload separation. Power is still good. Attitude is nominal. Power is nominal. Attitude is good. Power is nominal. And now we're standing by for that payload separation. Power systems remain healthy. And we have Cygnus spacecraft separation. CCAM maneuvers initiated, and uh, in, in fond memory of Mr. J.R. Thompson, we wish uh, Cygnus a smooth trip on the rest of their journey to the International Space Station. And uh, Pop 1, LC, Countdown 1. And Prop 1. And so with that, Cygnus now in orbit, the vehicle labeled the SSJR Thompson as its tradition for orbital ATK to name the Cygnus spacecraft for individuals who had an impact on the human spaceflight program for our nation. Uh, and for OA-9, they selected J.R. Thompson, who was a leader in the aerospace industry and a member of the Orbital ATK family. He worked at NASA, uh, the Marshall Space Flight Center, and also at Orbital Sciences, and uh, Orbital ATK honoring uh, his life uh, with the launch of this, the ninth resupply mission for Orbital ATK. But with that, the SSJR Thompson now in space in its preliminary orbit 
and soon in just a couple of days at the International Space Station. Core 1 LC Countdown 1, you can direct Yuzhno to power off their MS but and FMS ground. A lot of happy individuals there at the Wallops Flight Facility control room. We oversaw all of the final checkouts for Antares, but in this room here in Dulles, they're all now in control, overseeing all of the, uh, the, the flight of Cygnus to the International Space Station over the next couple of days. And they'll be working uh, hand in hand with the team here in Mission Control Houston once Cygnus arrives coming up on Thursday. And GSO LC. Copy that, GSO. And uh, Ops 2, uh, 475, record ground mock voltage and current. LC Ops 2, ground mock voltage 27.96 volts, 0 0.6 amps. And I copy all Ops 2, and you can remove ground mock power. Ground mock external power off. Copy that. And OPTM, I did get your uh, call that we have uh, uh, LOS. You can uh, stop telemetry archive at the DCOM. Copy LC and work. Archive stopped. And you can stop the LCC telemetry uh, display server and distributor logging. Copy. Distributor stopped. And you can stop G2 telemetry recording. Wilco. Recording Op stopped. Copy that. Uh, Orp Tam Ops 2, record power supply volts and currents. Big power supply 18, 29.97 volts, 0, 0.0 amps. Big power supply 19. 28.99 volts, 1.05 amps. Big power supply 22, 27.99 volts, 2.28 amps.